Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Integrity Matters by Turners. And my name is Chooks. Today is the third part of a series looking at reimagining university education in a digital world. With me in the house today is Dr. Ed Pitt from the University of Kent. Hello, Ed. Hi, Chooks. How are you doing? Very well, thank you. Um, just to get us started, can you give us a little bit about your background and um, what, what excites you about the work you do at, at um, Kent University or University of Kent, rather? Uh, so, yeah, I've been uh, involved in higher education for around about 18 years now. And I started off uh, sort of in a sports science world. And, and then naturally, my career progressed through my PhD into a more sort of educational support and development role where... I now work at the University of Kent since 2013, and I run uh, a PGCHE, which is for new career academics that are new to teaching in higher education. And this gives me a wonderful opportunity to work with these uh, early career academics and look at how they teach and improve the sort of structures of their teaching. And most importantly, integrate all of my research and assessment and feedback within to that role and sort of have a direct influence on uh, and shape the practice of, of future academics. And the great thing as well about the role is I also get to work with more established academics as we develop those uh, and, and look at innovations in teaching, again, heavily focused on my research outputs and how that can improve the, uh, the experience for, for students and staff at University of Kent. Nice. Um, really, you've got a very vast background and um, part of your contribution to the book um, on reimagining university education um, in a digital world is um, technology enhanced dialogic feedback. Um, just to begin the conversation, what does this mean and how can technology enhance how we give um, feedback dialogically? Yeah, so this is, I mean, one of the things that's happened in the last uh, five or six years is we've really started to question what feedback means in higher education. And a sort of new paradigm has been proposed by, by various authors have taken this on. And, and we've been sort of looking more at the active role of the students and, and how we conceive of their role. So the dialogue is really about the role that the student has in the process. And they're encouraged to seek and discuss feedback from multiple sources. There's an element of more responsibility for students. So rather than staff always being the people that uh, sort of fire, if you like, the feedback through the cannon at the students, it's more about them going out and seeking this and really working with that to, to look at how their own work can improve. And the dialogue is around all of those sorts of things that happen in those, in those situations. So it could be through um, some exemplars and discussing quality and standards, or it could be lots of interactions between students that are discussing their work. And really the important point is around how students utilize this feedback and improve as a result of those, those dialogues. So, so very much seeing feedback as part of the learning fabric rather than something that happens at the end. Really interesting work there. Um, looking at the need for that level of dialogue when giving feedback. And I, I think this is moving into the uh, area where we need to give more authentic feedback. The book refers to three dilemmas. Um, so I'd, li I'd like you to touch on these three dilemmas and um, what that means in terms of how we give um, or facilitate dialogue and feedback. Uh, yeah, absolutely. So, so my colleague and I, uh, Naomi Winston, we, we looked at this, um, you know, in a sort of systematic way and looked at the literature that was that was that was starting to become well established but we felt that there were some issues around how dialogue and technology can interact and the first dilemma was around whether or not uh, the 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 technology sort of re-replicated the monologic transmission where as I mentioned in earlier in the video that this sort of feedback cannon and shooting it so very much coming one way from the educator to the student and we were concerned that that dialogue perhaps was something that we needed to think of and how we could facilitate that. So we were worried that um, technology could replicate some of the inherent design issues. So rather than it being around, OK, technology can solve all this, it was thinking about how academics design their feedback processes so that there are opportunities for dialogue because the, the technology itself might not just facilitate that on its own. So it was a combination of, of how technology and design can, can coexist. 
The second dilemma was around these practical concerns or pedagogical concerns. And there was lots of research that we found attesting to the notion that you could speak uh, in one minute what you would normally sort of write. Um, in, in, it would take around six minutes. And similarly, students reported that it was easier to access the information and they could return and listen to it again if it was delivered uh, online. But this implies quite a lot of passiveness on behalf of the student in that it was given to the students. So what we were saying is that, well, if the student had been given a piece of work that was on uh, written feedback, um, they, could, they could return to that quite happily if they wanted to. It wasn't a case that just because it was written, uh, it, uh, it, it couldn't be returned to. So, so we were saying that, OK, the technology is great. It's enhancing the way that it can be sent to students. But how can we use the technology to improve the feedback processes? How can we, for example, increase those dialogues that are between students? So using that as a, as, a, as a stimulus rather than just replicating the older ways. And the fin final dilemma was around uh, satisfaction or student uptake. There's been lots and lots uh, of research in the last few years around the importance of students using feedback. Some have argued that feedback isn't really feedback until it is used by students. And I think that's a really important for us thing for us to consider. But at the same time, we have student satisfaction metrics that dominate the, the landscape of assessment of feedback in higher education. So how can we balance those two conflicting at times uh, issues? And we've, we've sort of looked at how students interpret, for example, face-to-face -face dialogue with, with academics. And lots of students report that that sometimes it can be rather challenging and, and difficult through power relationship struggles and effects of self-esteem when particularly things are, are a little bit difficult for the students. So, so a lot of students have reported that audio and video feedback and screen keep feedback um, is, is really great for that because it, it sort of breaks down that re relational barrier. And, and what we're saying is that, so how can we harness the power of that to, to increase the dialogic element and, and, and overcome the issues that I mentioned earlier around um, students perceiving face-to-face -face in the physical sense as a problem. And of course, the pandemic has, 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 has hugely uh, probably uh, and rapidly um, brought that in to, to, the, to the fore for many people. So we get a sense that more and more people are comfortable and some of the earlier issues around barriers to, to entry for, for academics and, and time issues Perhaps some of those have, 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 have moved away now, but again, it's, it's how we design this in. How do we really think about harnessing the power of technology to improve those, those dialogues between academics and students? I was really interested um, to see or actually to learn that um, students were open to audio feedback. And I was like, well, wow, that's, that's a really uh, big change. Um, most times we, 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 we find ourselves assuming that the written feedback is as well um, accepted as opposed to the audio. So I, I would, I would re really like to see an example or maybe some stats or data on how, on how that's looking since the pandemic to see if that's, if that's something we're doing more of. But talking about the dilemmas, you've also um, suggested some propositions to address this dilemmas. Can you just walk us through these uh, propositions? Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and as you probably can tell from some of our responses, the design element is something that we've really focused on in, in, in the book chapter. And it's really around how we might be able to create opportunities for students to use feedback in subsequent assess assessments. So this is looking at how uh, the program might be structured so that students can see links between uh, feedback episodes that they received. There's a lot of research around um, the feedback coming at too, too late in the process. So what Naomi and I have argued in the, in, in the chapter is really looking at how the, uh, the, the design sort of gives students opportunities during the process rather than at the end, because they can naturally do something about that for that particular assessment. Because the value of, of, of feedback is sometimes limited if there's no implementation area so some people have described this as somewhere for feedback to land and i think that's a really powerful image really it's it's where where can the students see that that landing site and what we've sort of suggested is that uh, as as the student move moves through their their experience we we, we are less uh, obvious in the landing spaces because we expect students as i mentioned to have more responsibility in the process so 
we very much scaffold it at the start and then we sort of start to withdraw that as they become more uh, expertise uh, in their in their areas. The second one is is rather than uh, seeing this as a deficit uh, approach, is seeing the value added of audiovisual feedback. And and what we are seeing is lots of research that attests to the positives of this. Um, and one of those areas is the fact that students can see it as far more supportive and approachable. Um, and it could be a great way to break down those relational barriers. Our students are very much uh, attuned to the, the sort of more uh, technological inputs that they will have experienced in their formative years as they've moved through, through school. And certainly we're aware that a lot of the kids that are going to be coming to university now uh, as adults will have experienced quite a few years of technology enhanced learning in their, in their school years. So, so we see this as sort of um, a, a way of, uh, of sort of bridging that gap as well and saying to them that the early use of audiovisual feedback, um, perhaps in lower risk student situations, so we're thinking in the early parts of modules where students are trying out things, we could use that for, for formative feedback. We could give them some quick uh, audio feedback. There's lots of tools available. There's inbuilt tools within lots of the software that we use so that we can then sort of start that dialogue and with an expectation for follow-up interactions, whether that be within the classroom situation or in the more formal summative end of, of modules, which are very, very much a part of the, the fabric of HE. So this we feel could encourage a lot more dialogue to happen throughout the process rather than at the end where it might be a little bit too, too late for students to do anything for that piece of work. But as I mentioned, it is that stimulus. It's how we can use the audio visual for a, uh, a stimulus. So it's not, we're not saying it's a total replacement for face to face. And as we exit the pandemic, we're going to see, I suspect, some elements that are going to be retained. And we're going to see some elements that we think, well, actually, that's really, really worked. And of course, we do need to carry out some more research to really sort of uh, rigorously understand the learning from, from, from those, those two years of, of disrupted learning and different types of learning that we've all experienced. Um, but we, we really think that we can look at how the interaction between formative design opportunities technology and then the subsequent summative opportunities and, and see that as a, as a whole process and a, and a joined up process. I do like the idea of um, student agency as part of the process, which is really good. Um, I think we need to start thinking more critically about how we involve students and how we make or increase that level of uptake for feedback as well. I'm just going to read a line I picked up from the book because I think this is a, an essential piece for any academic or educator who's watch, watching today. In order for technology enhanced feedback to facilitate dialogic interaction, the practice needs to, to be used in ways that move beyond the transmission of feedback comments and are more towards um, student uptake of feedback. Can you elaborate on this? Yeah, and, and this is something that we've, that we've been working on um, over the last few years. So we had a paper a couple of years ago that looked at the responsibility element um, and really sort of focused on it being a shared venture and, and saying to students that, yes, we provide some things in higher education. And yes, we are as academics responsible for, for the design of curricula, but really for feedback to have a positive impact on you, you've got to do something with it. It's got to be part of the process that you see as, 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 um, improving. You've got to use it as you go along. So, so whilst there will be feedback that may come from us, it's not just about that transmission. It is a negotiation. And all of those interactions that happen between uh, academics and, and students, whether that be uh, formally through, through assessment, but also all of those uh, interactions that happen in the classroom where lecturers may comment on pieces of work that you may have produced in the class or where you've said things in class and you've had dialogue, the back and forth, the elaboration and the collaboration of, of arriving at, um, a, 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 sort of a conclusion at the end of a seminar. All of those sort of interactions are, are more learning focused. They are more in, and dialogic rather than this, this transmission. You know, you, you do a piece of work. I tell you whether it was good or not, and I give you a bit of improvement. We're moving away from that. We're seeing feedback as far more as, as part of the process. And, and there's some interesting examples in, in recent literature. Um, so, for example, there's uh, a paper by Wollstonecroft and Domain in, in the UK where they took some business students 
And one week after their uh, summative assessment they, uh, that w- they were marked, they were provided with three minutes of individual audio feedback, uh, which gave them uh, an in- 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 um, a sort of indication of, of, of their performance. And importantly, they didn't give them the grade straight away. So they had to listen to the three minutes of feedback. So the software was uh, sort of confined. So they had to listen to that three minutes and then their grade would be received at the end. And the process of having to listen to that feedback, they said that that improved the way that students engage with their feedback because the grade was was detracted from, from that situation. And those that achieved the higher grade reported using the feedback um, in their essay to sort of spot where there were issues. And they felt that feedback was more personalised to them. But um, it was a welcome departure from their usual experience of feedback. When they looked at the grade and if it met their expectations, they perhaps sometimes would ignore that feedback. But when uh, it didn't match their grade, similarly, they would have have that 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 sort of um, feeling. So so detracting. So so it's quite a good use of technology to um, facilitate sending that back. So. In, in the past, that was called adaptive release, but that sometimes was a little bit more, more problematic because you could never guarantee that the student had, um, had looked at the feedback. So um, I think this is a good way of saying, well, we can, we can use technology to, to disrupt the, the process um, of, of that. That's, that's, that's a very interesting concept. And um, your, your colleagues in, in the UK who are doing that, what they're doing is going to resonate with a lot of academics who are watching this as well. Moving on into the space where we're looking at making assessment work for learning and for academics or educators who are watching this today, how would you um, support the process of rethinking or reimagining um, or using, utilizing dialogic feedback in as we rethink and reimagine assessment for, uh, for learning? Yeah, and I, and I think, you know, I've, I've talked about audio feedback so far, and, and I did mention video and screencasts, but I, I increasingly see more and more people using that, um, particularly because of the way that uh, the screencast feedback, it can situate the academic's uh, voice in terms of them uh, talking through their process of marking, but it can also allow the student to see specifically in their piece of work where that where that features. Um, so it's in a sense, you're in, in the mind's eye of the academic as they're marking the piece of work. And we've seen an evolution where people may have uh, sort of started with a script and then gone on and marked. And now I've, I've, I've even got colleagues at the moment that are, are just doing it as they would normally mark. So they're, they're just on and they're, and they're giving the student the full, the sort of thought process, which I think is, 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 you know, if you think about how you might harness the power of that, I've suggested to some academics, well, why not show students through an exemplar how you would mark that so that they can really see the thought processes and how you interpret assessment criteria and the quality that's in front of you when you mark. And I think that's a powerful way of of helping students to see. I think obviously subsequent to that, you would need to have some active engagement with students as well um, so that it's not just sort of uh, the transmission of that. But I think it's a good way in to, to harness that, that technology. And, and there's some, some really good uh, research coming out of Australia, actually. Um, so uh, Cavalieri et al. in 2019 evaluated whether audio and video feedback help students engage with feedback more successfully than the sort of conventional written feedback that they would have normally had. And the way they did this was to give them two draft assignments. And the advisor that they were assigned would look for the literacy and uh, language uh, that use and, and give them some feedback. And they would do this in two ways. The first one was through sort of track changes in, in a, in a, um, in a software package that we're all familiar with. And, and the other would be the audio visual feedback through, through screen capture. And this would have minimum written comments, so it would would um, give them more of the technology enhanced uh, feedback that we've been describing. And then, more importantly than anything else, the students had an opportunity to redraft that work for for summative grading. So the process was built in to the, to the construction. And overall, seventy seven percent of the written feedback was used, but eighty eight percent of the video feedback was used. So it, it, they suggest that when uh, audio video feedback was offered, it was around about 2.17 times more likely that the student would make successful changes to their work. And I think that's really, really important. And where that chimed with me is um, I've been doing some work with 
at um, academics in Australia around lower achievers. So those students that that really struggle to, to sort of raise their marks. And this particular research showed that um, when those those students uh, used the the word comments, around about fifty three percent of their of their work was was improved. However, when they used the video feedback, it was up to seventy eight percent. So it seemed to have a more profound effect on the lower achieving students. So I think that's really really important. Um, and the other area that we've seen technology used is um, with students filming their actual performances. So sometimes when students are really, really stressed and they produce a piece of work, they don't necessarily always remember uh, the actual process or, or the quality of, of the work. And they might have a, a sort of inflated or deflated impression. So mm. in some research, again, carried out in Australia around the OSCEs, which are, which are very, very much part of the medical education world. And they filmed the students doing the OSCEs. So they, they, they used um, body cameras and filmed the whole process and then used that, uh, those sort of uh, artifacts as a way of stimulating the recall around the feedback. So students would get to watch back the, the videos, they would mark each other, they would clarify where things had gone wrong. And the academics that did this found this far more um, sort of impactful on the students because they had an actual artifact to draw on. And they could rewind, they could pause, they could highlight, they could zoom in, all of these specific things. And the dialogue surrounding that then had a really powerful impact on the students. And where I thought this could be really useful is, is again, the drafts, preparing uh, people for uh, performative elements that might happen in very, very vast different disciplines to give the students a real opportunity to see, well, this is what you did. This is how you could improve for the future so that you're getting more inputs around uh, your performance as you go on from multiple sources. That's really interesting. Um, Carles, um, in 2015, and the research paper um, made a statement, which I'm only putting up here for emphasis because of the need for um, how we think about feedback. And it goes like this. It is what students can do with feedback rather than how the teacher provides it which is crucial. Um, can you um, elaborate on this and, and shed more light on why this is important? Yeah, and, and, and this, is, this is fundamental uh, to, to feedback. Um, you know, we, we, we can all, all academics probably uh, are very frustrated at, at times when they spend hours and hours and hours of marking, um, you know, thinking about how they can improve students' work, and yet the students perhaps don't collect the work or they don't now as we have technology enhanced feedback um, they don't necessarily log in and and, and download their, their script with the feedback comments on. Um, so, so this is where we're sort of thinking about design and thinking about the process and thinking about, well, how can we change our practice to change the students' practice with feedback? Uh, and there's been a lot of self-reflection in the field, you know, thinking, well, Perhaps the way that we did things before uh, engendered that behavior in our students, you know, and maybe if we create more opportunities that exist within the curriculum so that students can engage with feedback during the process, that that will improve their uptake. So, so again, you know, I mentioned earlier about landing spaces, places where feedback can be used um, so that students can really see how to, how, how to improve their learning as they go through. One of the things uh, we need to do better in terms of how we design learning experiences and learning content. And just in addition to what you said is um, thinking about how we want students to actually apply the feedback. I like the, one of the things you, you touched on there was um, have, giving the student enough time to actually apply it in and make the change in their summative assessment. That way we're better able to see how students are progressing. In the case of preferred feedback, it is somewhat known that learners engage more with audio feedback, like you mentioned earlier, uh, I think it's just because they see it as an individualized um, approach as opposed to reading feedback. Why do you think this is the case? Yeah, and I think some of the early stuff um, in the literature, I'm thinking, that, you know, there's some good papers by Lunt and Curran back in 2010 that really started to capture why this was something the students liked. Um, and I, th I use that word liked because I think there is quite a lot of research that looks at students' preferences and students' liking 
what we particularly touched on in the book chapter was this notion that there's not a large amount of evidence for uh, improvement as a relate in, in relation to that 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 change in medium. So, so you know, we, we're not surprised that, that that students like feedback like this. Um, there's an element of novelty. There's an element of personalization, which again is something that students, particularly in a huge cohort, like the idea of that because sometimes it can it can feel a little bit um, like you're sort of anonymous when there's a very very large cohort. You don't necessarily have that interaction, and there is you know research where uh, students sort of almost feel like the uh, the the video or the audio feedback is a conversation with their with their lecturer even though it is completely one way and it's all pre-recorded um, but there's something in the in the psychology of that 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 it's that's that it's the lecturer talking to them and i think there's an element of the intonation and the emphasis that that is harder to convey in written form um than it is in the audio and the video so there's an element of that because you know we're we're, we're social animals we're, we're 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 relating to each other all the time so so again you know if you, if you look at the pandemic, what was the first thing we all did? We, we we went to technology to have that interaction with people. So I think there's an element of that. But again, what we need to do is is look more towards the improvement. I think that's that's got to be our focus as we move forward. How can we harness the power of technology to improve that uptake? Um, because otherwise it will just be information in the ether if, if students aren't using it. And we'll be replicating those, those older ways of doing things that I've mentioned mm. that, that we want to move away from. So besides um, technology-enhanced um, dialogic feedback, what other strategies can we um, take into consideration when trying to make assessments work for learning? Absolutely, and I, and I think you know I've, I've mentioned this that that fundamentally it's it's giving students opportunities um, to work with the feedback. So it's about our curricular design. It's about looking at assessment and feedback in the round, thinking about how it maps across programs, how it's integrated so that students are getting an experience that gives them the opportunities. And in some of our recent research, myself and David Carlos have been looking at performance arts, and we've been looking at how th those educators design that into the curricula. And it's very much feedback is part of the culture of the learning environment. So, that, so it's seen from day one that there will be uh, iterative exchanges of, of work in progress, uh, students are asked to to comment on the quality of people's work in progress as they refine their acts before before their um, performance at the end of a module, for example. And there's very much a dialogue around the quality. And more importantly, the power of this is, is that we could see that students were able to recognize week on week how students had incorporated feedback from previous weeks. So again, there was a there was a, a notion of of an expectation. Um, and I think that's one of the, th the ways that you change uh, the culture is, is, is changing the practice so it becomes a new thing that everyone's comfortable with. And we also saw elements where there was an emphasis on self-generated feedback. So in the last few years, we've seen a move towards helping students generate their own feedback. So looking at how all of these things around them, the sources, the work that they're seeing, their own feedback they're getting from, from, from different people and how they can internalize that and generate feedback for themselves so that they become aut more autonomous. The key thing in all this is then applying that to their own work so that they're, they're able to improve that as a result of all of these inputs. And I think that's, that's for us at the moment, the, the holy grail of, of feedback research is, is really being able to get that relationship between making uh, critical comments about others but also then applying that to your own work so that you can improve. Now, that is an awesome way to, to put an end to today's conversation. I wanted to say a big thank you to Dr. Ed Pitts from Ken University um, for sharing his insights as we discussed um, technology-enhanced dialogic feedback. Thank you so much for um, your time today. Thanks, Chooks. Most enjoyable. <laughs>